At its most basic level, a pseudonym is a prank. Yet the motives that lead writers to assume an alias are infinitely complex, sometimes mysterious even to them. Names are loaded, full of pitfalls and possibilities. Virginia Woolf, who never adopted a nom de plume herself, <clears throat> once expressed the fundamental and maddening condition of authorship. Never to be yourself, and yet always, that is the problem. She was, she was identifying the predicament of the personal essayist, but identity can seem crippling to any writer. A change of name, much like a change of scenery, provides a chance to begin again. To a certain extent, all writing involves impersonation, the act of summoning an authorial eye to create the speaker of a poem or the characters in a novel. But some writers are unable to engage in such alchemy or don't want to without relying on an alter ego. If the authorial persona is a construct, never wholly authentic, no matter how autobiographical the material, then the pseudonymous writer takes this notion to yet another level, inventing a construct of a construct. The merging of an author and an alter ego is an unpredictable thing. It can become a marriage, a faithful, a faithful and sturdy partnership, or it can prove a swift, intoxicating affair. A literary self can be tried on temporarily, then dropped like a robe, or the guise might exist as something to be guarded at all costs. A pseudonym may give a writer the necessary distance to speak honestly, but it can just as easily provide a license to lie. Anything is possible. For that rare bird known as the commercially successful author, there is typically less at stake in going with a pen name. <clears throat> Nora Roberts, who uses, um, who's written more than 200 novels, has, uh, has a, for her, using a transparent or open, open pseudonym is a savvy marketing strategy, a way to keep up her busy production line. Roberts had initially resisted writing as someone else, but her agent had talked her into it. There's diet Pepsi, there's regular Pepsi, and there's caffeine-free Pepsi, she said. It's all about brand extension. Mm -hmm. A new work by Stephen King, whose, work, whose books have sold more than 500 million copies, is a reassuring promise of success to his publisher. It's also critic-proof. Yet in the late 1970s, <clears throat> feeling hemmed in by his prolific output, King introduced the pen name Richard Bachman. As he later said, it was easy to add someone to his interior staff. The name Richard Bachman actually came from when they called me and they said, we're ready to go to press with this novel. What name shall we put on it? And I hadn't really thought about that. Well, I had, but the original name, Gus Pillsbury, had gotten out on the grapevine. And I really didn't like it very much anyway. And they said they needed it right away. And there was a novel by Richard Stark on my desk. So I used the name Richard. And that's kind of funny because Richard Stark is itself a pen name for Donald Westlake. And what was playing on the record player was You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet by Bachman Turner Overdrive. <laughs> so I put the two of them together and came up with Richard Bachman. King's practical measure to avoid saturating the market was a success. But in 1985, a bookstore clerk in Washington, D.C. did some detective work and exposed King's secret. The author subsequently issued a press release announcing Bachman's death from, quote, cancer of the pseudonym. <laughs> Sometimes, though, literary fakery crosses the line from being a harmless alias employed for the author's private benign purpose and crosses out into out outright fraud. In early 2008, a writer named Mar Margaret B. Jones published Love and Consequences, a memoir of hope and survival. This was a harrowing story of the author's experiences as a foster child and a Bloods gang member in South Central Los Angeles. But the book was a fabrication, and Margaret B. Jones did not exist. Her duplicity was exposed by her own sister. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I get an extra five seconds for that. Uh, um, <laughs> Jones, it turned out, was the persona of Margaret Seltzer, a 33-year-old white woman living with her daughter in a four-bedroom bungalow in Eugene, Oregon. Oregon. Seltzer had grown up with her biological parents in affluent Sherman Oaks, California, and had attended a private Episcopal day school. She did not have a black foster mother whom she called Big Mom, nor foster siblings named Terrell, Ty, Nisha, and Nisi. She was neither a blood nor a crip, and she had not, at 14 years old, received a gun as a birthday gift. In fact, she had written much of the book at a Starbucks in Los Angeles. <clears throat> What's in a name? Everything and nothing. As Susan Sontag once lamented, Every writer, after a certain point, when one's labors have resulted in a body of work, experiences himself or herself as both Dr. Frankenstein and the monster. Authorial identity can become a trap. As many writers know firsthand, the literary world is tough. One minute you're the toast of the town, the next minute you're just toast. 
the desire to emancipate oneself from the shackles of familiarity and start anew under an altogether, altogether different name makes perfect sense. In fact, why not more pseudonyms? <laughs>